testing the Riverpoint POP 3D scanner to find out if it's effective and if it's worth your money. So I'm back with another review of a live on Kickstarter product. And I wasn't seeking this one, but some of my patrons were really interested in an independent test before they backed it with their money. Today we're looking at the POP 3D scanner from Riverpoint. And its price versus performance is superior to anything I've tested so far. However, it still does have some limitations. In this video, I'm gonna test it on a wide range of 3D scans to see if it's right for you. The Revo Point Pop 3D scanner is currently on Kickstarter. It will eventually retail for 500 US dollars. But if we scroll down, we can see that the early bird price is 269 US dollars. As usual with a Kickstarter, there's a bunch of claims. And based on my testing, I would say most of them are accurate, but soon we'll get to my results. As the Kickstarter is still active, that means that I got this one for free. And as this document says, it's a beta version. The main item that comes with the package is the actual 3D scanner. It runs on 5 volts and draws 1 amp through a USB 3 connection. On the front we have an infrared light source, two infrared sensors and an RGB camera. Also included is this nifty little tripod. It doubles as a stable platform on a desk or a suitable handle if you're doing handheld scanning. The included USB 3 cable has two screws to secure it into the back of the scanner, which means it won't be accidentally knocked out while you're moving everything around. The kit comes with an additional accessory to hold your phone if you're using your mobile for 3D scanning. It goes in between the scanner and the rest of the tripod so you can easily see the screen and get feedback on what you're scanning when you're on the go. We have another box with a motorized turntable and it's got registration dots on the top to help the tracking of the object as it rotates. Operation is via a simple on-off switch. Also included in the kit are a range of accessories, and one of those is this resin model included as a test scan object. We also have a black sheet, effectively a folded up garbage bag. We have some blue tack, I assume for holding tricky objects on the turntable. We have some registration dot stickers. These can be placed onto objects that are hard to scan to assist with tracking. And we also have a set of non-disposable black rubber gloves. These prevent the scanner from scanning your hands if you're holding the object. Finally, we have a USB flash drive. On the flash drive, we have a fairly detailed instruction manual. It goes through all of the software and the processes step by step. We have a user guide tips document, and that goes into a little bit more detail on some of the software features and problems you might encounter. And we have a demonstration and instructional guide video that once again goes through the processes of using the scanner. That's a fair amount of stuff and everything we need to get started. But before we scan anything, I'd like to go over the 3D scanners I've used in the past, as I think it's really important in helping me evaluate this by comparing them. The first 3D scanning system I tried was called David Laser Scan, and this was almost 10 years ago. It involved buying a projector, a webcam, and 3D printing custom parts to mount both of them on a tripod. We also had a calibration corner with a specific pattern. In the software, we had to tweak some levels until we got enough contrast between black and white. Then we would calibrate for the position of the dots on the calibration pattern. After this, we scanned the calibration corner in order to assess the positioning. And after all of this, we could start to actually scan our object with structured light. Each scan would only be from a single side, so we needed to do multiple scans and for each, clean up all of the noise around them for the surrounding environment, eventually, after a lot of work and stitching together, ending up with a fairly reasonable 3D scan. On top of buying the projector, webcam and anything else required, the license for David Laser Scan used to be a few hundred euro. But it seems that since then, they've been bought up by HP, and you have to buy the whole thing in a package for quite a big price. This time last year, I reviewed the Creality CRT 3D scanner. Like David Laser Scan, it still required calibrating, but the process was now quite automated. It's also a structured light scanner, projecting known patterns onto the object, with the camera analyzing the way they distort over the contours of the model. One of the big improvements was automatic rotation to get a full 360 degree scan. 
and the multiple scans were also automatically stitched together for pretty detailed results, however, you wouldn't call them perfect. Definitely way better than my first setup, but a price of 900 US dollars is still going to be beyond the reach of most people. A fair while ago, I showed you how to 3D scan with an Xbox 360 Kinect sensor. And the main advantage here was you could move around your object in real time, building up the scan without any prior calibration. You can tell who the person is, but it's pretty light on detail. And probably the greatest concern is that there's a lot of artifacts that need to be cleaned up in post-processing. However, it is the budget option and a free version of the software is available, but thanks to the polygon limit, you're probably better off spending the $130 to get the pro version. So far, I've used the Kinect, which is cheap, easy, point and shoot, but not that accurate. And I've used systems that cost a lot more money, but are more cumbersome to set up by using structured light. I think the Reverpoint Pop 3D scanner sits nicely in between these in terms of price and performance. In fact, using it feels like a much higher quality version of the Kinect scanner. We plug in the scanner and start the software and then click on new model. The user guide tips document explains the difference between these, but basically they're presets for the exposure of the scanner as well as the size of the object. You can still however change the exposure and the gain for both the RGB and the infrared camera, looking at the preview to make sure that your object is being picked up correctly. The other setting of note here is the clip plane and that decides whether flat surfaces are ignored or not during your 3D scan. For my first scan, I used the face preset and left it on no color and immediately the sensor seemed to be picking up the contours of my skin fine. We now click the play button and the scanning begins. We can see a green object in the preview window and that tells us that we're tracking our 3D object as we move the scanner around. On the upper left, we have the feed from the RGB camera and on the lower left, we have the feed from the infrared camera and that's the main one we need to pay attention to because that's what captures the 3D geometry. Much like the Kinect sensor, the basic process involves moving slowly around the object until your entire object is scanned. If the preview goes red, it means you've moved too quickly and tracking has been lost and you simply move back to a known location until the two sync together. When you're happy that you've captured enough data, you click stop and then all of the point cloud will be fused together automatically and even for complex scans on a slower computer, this is generally done in under a minute. At this stage, it might look like a solid 3D object, but it is only a point cloud and if we zoom in, that becomes very apparent. Therefore, the next step is to click on the mesh button. That will give you a confirmation box and once we click yes, in under a minute, our point cloud will be turned into a mesh or surface. This was the very first 3D scan that I did and I have to say I was truly impressed. There's way way more detail than the Kinect sensor and structured light scanning of faces is pretty much impossible because it's so hard to hold still for the amount of time required. When you're done, you can export in ply, obj or sdl file formats. Now the kit does come with a turntable and it works in much the same way. The object is rotated by the turntable rather than the scanner moving around the object when you use it by hand. Once it's done a full rotation, you can pick up the object and rotate it to the top and bottom to make sure all of the geometry is captured. You might be wondering whether you need to use the gloves and the answer is yes. As you can see, the bare skin is picked up by the scanner and will become part of your 3D object. Again, we go through the process of making a mesh and then exporting a file. Here are the results of this scan. I think they're pretty reasonable. They could do with a little bit of smoothing in post-processing, but this file is printable. I'd also say my results are on par for detail with the demonstration video. There's actually a second piece of software that comes with the package and it's intended for post-processing. The first tool and one of the most useful is the crop or clip tool. We can draw a line and then adjust our plane and use it to chop off parts of the model that we don't want. We have a fill hole tool and that will attempt to fill any holes or gaps in on our 3D model and in the case of this face, that means turning it from a surface with no thickness to a blobby object. The smooth tool does exactly what it sounds like, smoothing out some of the bumps on the surface that come from the point cloud scanning technique. Here's the smoothing before and after in Mesh Mixer as you can see, it does smooth it out, but it also seems to lose just a little bit of detail. 
Now I've found that the exported models from this software weren't quite watertight, but importing them into MeshMixer made it really easy to close the gaps. Also, like every 3D scanning method that I've used, there's going to be artifacts left behind that still need to be manually tidied up. Once again, the free software MeshMixer is my favourite tool for this. We make a selection by brushing the surface around the artifact, and then press F for Erase and Fill. Compared to the Kinect sensor, these models had very little artifacts and I found it quite quick to clean them up. If you're after a complete guide on cleaning up 3D scans with MeshMixer, I've got an old video of mine linked in the video description. So now you know how it works, but let's try and find some of the quirks and limitations by exploring a range of scans and scenarios. I know people will be interested in whether the parts scanned are dimensionally accurate, so I reprinted one of my scans, and it's hard to measure it exactly to compare, but it seems to me like it's within at least 1% of the original. Let's scan some stuff to see the results, starting with this shoe. The scanner did a good job on this, even picking up the texture on the side. There are some artifacts that need cleaning up, and I didn't try to scan the bottom, therefore its attempt to seal off the shape has led to this bulbous underside that would need to be cut off in post-processing. How about some kids toys, roughly the same size. I posed the Barbie sitting down on the turntable and it did a pretty reasonable job, picking up some texture in the clothing, all of the facial features, and even a pretty good attempt at the hair, which the instructions state that the scanner can't really do. Once again, because I didn't scan the underside, it's added on this bulbous cover, but this could be clipped flat in Mesh Mixer. The Iron Man model picked up a fair amount of detail, but there were some areas where the scanner struggled, for instance, trying to get the thin gap in between the arm and the leg, and it also cut off the fingers. Apart from that, we can see quite a lot of detail in the back of the armor. Structured light scanners typically really struggle with highly reflective surfaces like those on this pot. After fiddling with the infrared exposure and gain, I was able to boost the settings and successfully scan the outside of the pot. There is an issue where it came back to the start and the parts don't quite line up. Perhaps sticking on some of those registration marks will assist with this. When I revealed the channel's project car, we saw that some of the interior plastics were literally turning to dust. So I removed one of the pieces from the car and cleaned off the excess gunk with the aim of 3D scanning and printing a replacement. I did need to play quite a lot with the settings to make sure the surface was picked up, eventually deciding to mount the piece on a tripod and move the scanner around it rather than using the turntable. I scanned the front and back separately and then used the merge feature of the post-processing software to lay markers out on the surface before clicking merge and having the software automatically rotate and align the two halves of the scan. In terms of making it manifold from this point, the software did an okay job. However, I would like to do most of it in Mesh Mixer after taking more time to get a cleaner scan. This type of thing is possible, but it's gonna be a pretty involved project. So we can see that compared to the Kinect sensor, the increase in scan quality on the Rever point is significant. So to find the limits, I decided to 3D scan a bust printed on my Frozen Sonic Mini 4K. And unsurprisingly, this scanner can capture nowhere near the detail that the resin printer can produce. There's quite a lot of contours and texture there, but you need to be realistic in your expectations of what a cheap 3D scanner can achieve. Let's talk about one more really important factor that you might not have thought about, and that is sunlight. You can't see it with the naked eye, but the scanner produces its own infrared light source, which means you can have the room quite dark while you're 3D scanning, and it won't affect how 3D geometry is captured. In fact, I found it better to block out natural sunlight to get more consistent results. Now this is particularly pertinent when it comes to outdoor scanning, which is shown in the demonstration videos. The idea is that you can directly connect the scanner to your mobile phone or tablet by way of using a USB adapter. I was really keen to try this, but unfortunately on three different devices, the app would crash as soon as I gave it permission to allow access to the scanner. Not to be defeated, I dragged my laptop out to the garden and picked a statue similar to those in the demo video. I found, however, that in the middle of the day, it had a lot of trouble tracking and basically I couldn't get anything scanned. The developer confirmed that natural sunlight can overwhelm the infrared sensors, 
so I waited until dusk and the results were instantly better. I was able to scan the whole way around the object and the result was great. I consider this one of the best scans that I've done while testing this product. Apparently compatibility for a whole range of Android devices will be added in time and support will be available for Apple too once the app has been approved on the App Store. Just keep in mind that if you want to scan outdoors, you need to watch out for direct sunlight. Now, if you're already considering a 3D scanner, you don't need me to tell you what you could use it for. Personally, I had quite a lot of fun tweaking my face in Mesh Mixer and setting up a rather unusual object. This is the final printed object and it's pretty freaky because no matter what angle you look from, the face appears to look and follow you around the room. The trick is that the negative of my face has been cut out from a block, so when backlit and viewed from the right angle, we have this ghostly effect. Hopefully I've shown enough in this video that you can tell whether this is the right 3D scanner for you. Either way, let me know your thoughts about this product down below in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D scanning and 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.